Stella Given, The Roaring Tower. My father bent his head to kiss me, but I turned my face away, and his lips brushed the edge of my veil instead. Over his shoulder, I met my mother's grieved eyes, and my own feel filled with tears. I lowered my veil, the trembling fingers murmured some words which I have now forgotten, and stepped into the compartment, my father holding open the door for me. On the seat in the corner lay a bunch of white roses, a copy of a lady's journal, and a basket, packed with my refreshment for the journey. My heart was like stone. The roses picked from the garden of our house in Islington. Soften it not a whit. I moved them aside carefully and sank into my corner seat. I said not a word, and my father and mother stood in silence too. How I wished they would go away. You will write tomorrow, my child, and tell us what your journey was like and how your Aunt Julia is, said my mother. Yes, Mama. My lips felt stiff and cold. Remember, Clara, we shall expect you to take full advantage of the Cornish air and to return to us in a very different frame of mind and quite restored to health. My father's voice was a warning. Yes, Papa. I folded my black-gloved hands on my lap and stared out of the window, avoiding my mother's eye. The passion, which invade a heart at nineteen, like a beautiful, menacing army, seemed faded and small enough if one looked back on them after a lapse of fifty years, as I am doing now. But on the late summer morning I described, as I waited with my parents under the dome of the railway station, no heart could have been fiercer and yet colder than mine. One voice, which I should never hear again, sounded in my ears, and one face, which I had promised to forget, filled my eyes. All else, as that German philosopher wrote, was folly. Well, my parents had parted us, and my, my heart was broken, and there was no more to be said. I wish... The train would start so that I could be alone. The journey was uneventful. My Aunt Julia was not wealthy enough to afford a carriage, and when, on the evening of the same day, I got out of the train at the Cornish town, I found that I must take a fly to the village two miles hence where she lived, which was near the sea. I found an ancient carriage driven by a surly-looking old man in a great cape, and the porter, with this little old fellow's help, hoisted my trunk into the driver's seat, gave me a gallant arm into the carriage, and with a wink at the cabby, we were off. We left the town behind, and at last, in twilight, we came to the end of the last lane and faced a little sandy bay, in which broke the waves of the open sea. On the other side of the bay stood the village where my aunt lived. The horse slackened his pace almost to a walk, and the wheels slid in the fine sand as we crossed the bay. The soft sound of the falling waves and the lights shining in the village windows were balm to me. Suddenly I saw something which even then startled and impressed me so much that I leaned forward and plucked at the driver's cape. What is that? What are those ruins there on the left? I asked, pointing. He did not turn his head in the direction in which I pointed, and I had some difficulty in hearing his surly, indistinct reply, which came after a pause. That'll be the roaring tower, he said at last, curling his whip round his horse's ribs. I looked with a livelier interest than I had looked at any object for months past at the indistinct outline of the ruined circular tower which faced the breaking waves and which was almost covered by a fine bush of wild roses. 
It was no more than a circular rim of stone, higher at some points than then at others. But the circle was unbroken. It stood by itself at the lowest curve of the low cliff, encircling the bay. I remember that I sat upright in the swaying carriage as we drew nearer to the village, and eagerly studied the tower until a curve in the cliff hid it from sight. And even when it had disappeared, I saw it plainly in my mind's eye, like the dazzling memory of a light after it had gone out. My Aunt Julia's greeting was kindly but reserved, as befitted a welcome to a troublesome and headstrong niece who had been so imprudent as to bestow her affections on an unsuitable wooer. I was given to understand that my month's stay with her was not to be a time of idle repining, mooning. I remember she called my listless air. I was to help her with the hemming sheets, with her fowls, and with her garden. But after I'd made in my bed in the morning, tidied my room, and helped Bessie to feed the fowls, my time was my own until midday dinner, and this was the time I liked best of all, as much, that is, as I liked any time in those unhappy days. I clambered from rock to rock, waded through the pools in a bitter dream, and saw with unseeing, unhappy eyes, conservatories and hothouses of the sea, green fronds and purple and red, swaying below me in an innocent beauty. But I only grieved the more to see them. Was I not alone in the midst of beauty, and could be so forever? And my heart grew harder, my tongue less apt to exclaim or praise, and my thoughts turned every day more and more inward upon myself. The Roaring Tower, which you may be sure was the first place I visited on the first day of my stay, became my favourite haunt. Its rosebush was in fullest flower, and no matter what time of the day I visited it, the first sound I heard as I flung myself down on the parching grass, breathless with my climb up to the cliffside, was the sustained, slumberous drone of the wild bees ravaging the open chalices of the roses. I have written the first sound I heard, but there was another sound. I learned before I had been staying with Aunt Julia a week whence the tower got its strange name. It was the noon of a burning and cloudless day. I was returning languidly along the cliff edge from a walk to a village which lay inland, swinging my hat in my hand, my eyes half closed against the waving glitter of the grass and the smiting glitter of the sea. I was not thinking of anything in particular, not even of my sorrow. My mind lay like a black marsh under the sun, flowerless, stagnant. If there was a thought hovering at the back of my head, and write it now with a smile. It was a hopeful surmise that there might be fresh fish for dinner. But had I been taxed with this, I should have denied it with anger. I hugged my grief. It was all I had. Nothing could heal it. It was a deathless wound. Alas, the bitterest lesson I have since learned is how gently and remorselessly time steals with an hour dearest wounds from us. As I drew near the tower, I glanced, as usual, in its direction. A little group of village people stood about it, the women clustering together at some distance, the men scattered round it in a broken circle like a, a doubtful advance guard. As I drew near, I heard an indescribable sound, which seemed to come from no particular spot, but from the whole surrounding air, which I thought at first, for lack of better knowledge, to be the drone of bees in a swarm. It was a soft, hollow, furious roaring, such a sound as a giant distant waterfall might make, the sound I have heard that great hunter my uncle Max describe when he told us how his heart would shake in his body to hear in the dead of the night the solemn, far-off voices of lions at their wooing and hunting in starlight desert. 
the sound rose and fell in waves, exactly as the roaring of an animal rises and falls. As I advanced over the grass, intending to ask one of the women what was amiss, I saw my own inward uneasiness reflected in the sly, downward glance of the village people. What is it? What is the matter? I asked sharply of a woman near me. What is that strange noise? She hesitated, glanced appealingly at the man by her side, but he avoided her eyes. I repeated my question imperiously. It is only the roaring tower, she said at last reluctantly, when the rose bush is all out and on sweltering hot days, miss. The tower roars like you can hear. What is it? What makes that awful sound? Again, there was silence. The other villagers were looking curiously at me. A few of them drew slowly near to our little group, but no one attempted to answer me. At length, from the back of the group, a man's doubtful voice volunteered. They say it's a water under the tower, miss. There's a great cave under the tower. So they say... When the tide gets into it, it makes that noise. There were one or two half-hearted assents to this, but I was not satisfied. The explanation was plausible and yet unconvincing. But the uneasy manner of the villagers, their inquisitive eyes, repelled me, and I hastened to leave the spot. I had been with Aunt Julia a week, when one morning I went out into the kitchen to give Bessie some linen which she had promised to wash for me. She was not there, but at a corner of a kitchen table sat a little fair-haired girl, busy with paper and pencils, which she used from a painted box at her elbow. This was Jenny, Bessie's niece, whom my aunt allowed to play in the kitchen she was a good, quiet child. Good morning, Miss Clara, she whispered, looking shyly at me. Where's your Aunt Jenny? I asked impatiently. I wanted to be off to the seashore. She must wash these ruffles for me today. I shall need them for church tomorrow. She's gone to market, Miss Clara. She won't be back for an hour or more. Oh, then it's very frightful and careless of her. They will never be dry and pressed in time for tomorrow. Give them to her as soon as she comes in, Jenny, and say I must have them by this evening. But just as I was flouncing out of the kitchen, my annoyance increased by Jenny's solemn, timid stare. I stopped suddenly and picked up her pencil box from the table. Why, there's the roaring tower, I said, after myself in a new voice, full of pleasure as I felt the, at the sight of the picture painted on the lid of the box. Where did you get this, Jenny? Who painted it? And what's this queer creature with the snout close to the tower? Gave me, Davy gave me that, drawled Jenny. Daft Davy, they call him. He's not right in the head. He painted the box for me with that queer beast. And Davy said he's seen it. I stared at her. The back of the box, wondering where the weak-minded old man could have found his model for the gross, long-snouted monster with four brown paws, which he had painted squatting close to the tower. You mustn't tell lies, Jenny. It's wicked, I said primly. But Davy has seen it, Miss Clara, Jenny persisted, long ago when he was a little boy. That's the noise we hears, coming out of the tower, and the rose bush is all out. That's why he called it a roaring tower. There's that poor bear thing. Shut up in there. He can't get away, Davy says. I continued to stare at her. She did not seem at all frightened. One little hand was posed over the drawing as though she was about to go on with her game. Well, I said at last, drawing a deep breath, you are a very wicked little girl to repeat Davy's lies, Jenny. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. But my voice did not sound so severe as I should have liked. Yes, Miss Clara, I'm sorry, whispered Jenny, anxiously. Then I went towards the door, but as the 
But at the door I paused and called back to her curiously. Weren't you frightened, Jenny? When Davy told you about it? Oh no, it's Clara, she replied sedately. He don't hurt people, that bare thing don't. Everyone's afraid of him round here. No one's sorry for him a bit. He don't hurt people. He only wants to go get away home, Davy says. Well, after such talk between us, where should my steps go? But towards the tower. In the afternoon, when my aunt was taking her nap in the garden, I crossed the sands and climbed the gentle slope toward it, and there it was, half mantled with its rose bush, its very stones, steeped in quivering heat and silence. Bees droned in the flowers, butterflies reeled above the higher branches. I crossed the grass and mounted the fallen stone, which I always used as a step whenever I wanted to look down onto the circle of grass inside the tower. In the early morning, the rose bush and the wall cast a lopsided shadow halfway across the grass, and at sunset the shadow reappeared on the other side, but now at high noon, when I looked down on the grass, it was shadowless, clear, and as deep as emerald. I leaned my elbows on the broken stone rim and stared downwards. My thoughts were vague. Certainly I was not afraid, and this now seemed strange to me, for daft Davy's drawing depicted a beast that was enough to put queer thoughts in the mind of a better balanced girl than I was. But all I felt, idling there in the heat and drowsy silence, was a kind of mischievous curiosity and a return of the inexplicable pity I had experienced when I heard the tower at its roaring, as I lingered, more asleep than awake, and an infinitely soft tremor began to jar in the air, scarce distinguishable from the far-off rumour of the sea, and it grew in volume, rising above the sound of the waves and the bees, until it dominated them entirely and I realised that the tower was roaring, and that I stood like a swimmer on the sea-girt spit of land, in the full tide of its sound. Then, indeed, my heart began to beat a little faster. I glanced quickly over my shoulder, and took my elbows from the wall, and prepared a flight. But I did not go. I stayed, and no one was more surprised than myself, for pity had come back into my heart, that astonishing, irrational pity for a mere sound which I had felt before. I hesitated on my stone pedestal, gripping the wall with one hand and peering down into the silent pit of green. There was nothing there, of course. Grass burned coolly in the sunlight, and the bees hung among the roses, and the soft, piteous sound roared about me in waves, abandoned, despairing. Frightened and moved as I was, I did a strange thing. I hung over that empty pit, calling softly and softly. Can you hear me? Poor soul, poor tormented creature. Can I help you? I would, if I could. The foolish words, banal and human, altered back from the airy but impassable wall of beauty presented by rosebush and glimmering grass. I called again over the ominous hollow. Listen, I am here. I would pray for you if prayers would help you. You poor, lost thing, you. You have a friend left on earth. If you care to, if you care to have her, I will do what I can. My eyes streamed with the first unselfish tears that I had shed for months. Scarce knowing what I did, I put my hands firmly on the wall and vaulted the low drop into the hollow. Heaven alone knows what purpose I thought that would serve. I landed with a jarring shock, staggered forward and fell on my hands and knees in the grass. I was conscious that all I could see of the familiar world I'd left was a rough circle of bluest sky against which the rose bush moved in the wind. All about me, stunning the ears with soft reiteration, rose and fell the roaring 
Tower, the voice of the Rhine Tower. Well, I said aloud, shakily, scrambling to my feet and standing with my back almost touching the wall as though I were at bay. Here I am in the middle of the world, with a vengeance. I must go through it now. But the words were unnecessarily bold. Nothing happened, not even the catastrophe expected. These feelings, relieved by my shower of tears, slowly grew calmer. The roaring seemed to be dying down in the long, exhausted peals of sound, or else my ears were growing used to it. Of course, the tide is going out, I murmured, walking slowly round the circle of grass, brushing the wall with the tips of my fingers. How silly of me. I blushed for my tears and pity a few moments ago. My prison was not really a prison. I knew I could get out of the moment, and I wanted to, by scrambling up the six feet or so of rough wall, which provided more footholds than I needed. But I liked to linger there, shut away from the world in the sunshine of silence. I sat down on the grass under the overhanging mass of the rose bush. I leaned back against the wall with a tired sigh. How deep the quiet was, for now the roaring had ceased. Not a bee droned, not a butterfly stirred. The air of summer cool, bit of silence, smell, sweet. It would be easy for me to write at this point I must have fallen asleep. But I know, as I know that my, my body must soon die, that I did not sleep, even for a few seconds. I was awake, wide awake, and I saw what I saw. A shadow rose from the emerald grass. It was, it was brown and large, larger by many times than I was. And at first, it seemed like a thickening of the air immediately above the grass, and I blinked my eyes once or twice, thinking they were still dim from my recent tears, but the shadow persisted. It grew darker, thicker, began to take shape. It was squat, obese, crouching with a small head, sunk between its shoulders, a long snout, and four paws, drawn up rat-like against its furred sides. I bent forward, blinking my eyes again. I even rubbed them with my fists, but the shadow did not move. And as I watched it, the faint sound jarred against, again on the still air, rose to the rumour of noise, fell to a whisper and rose again. The tower was roaring, and the sound came from the throat of the monster before me. With its head flung back, the creature, vision, spectre, whatever it may have been, turned its head from side to side as it roared, as though in, in extremity of anguish. I caught the glint of its oblique eyes as the head swayed. Did the monster look at me? Strange question with more than a hint of ludicrousness. How can one speak in sober earnest of looks exchanged between the dweller in this world and a visitor from some world at which I cannot even guess? But it seems to me, remembering that the beast recognised my presence there, for soon it made a blundering, circular movement and turned its head towards me, still roaring pitilessly as though entreating my help. So we faced each other. I am the voice of the roaring tower, and as I looked, every feeling driven from my heart suddenly flooded back in a huge wave of pity. I held up my hands. I spoke to the monstrosity before me as though it would understand. Is there anything I can do? I whispered. Shall I fetch a clergyman? But even as the foolish words left my dry lips, the brown shadow changed. I cannot describe what followed. I 
I am only a human being. The pen of one of Milton's archangels would be needed for that. The shadow streamed upwards, melting as it streamed. It seemed to be drawn straight into the zenith, sucked by some invisible strength. I had, for a terrifying flash of time, a glimpse of huge wings, feathered with copper plumes, from tip to tip of a face, crowned with hair like springing rays of gold, a wild face smiling down at me in ecstasy, of a sexless body, vain again with gold, as a leaf is vain. A blinding shock, Passed through my frame, which may have been. May the creature's God forgive me if I blaspheme. An embrace of gratitude. Then it had gone. It had gone as though I had never seen it. There was nothing there. The roaring tower was empty as sun dried bone. I could feel that. I sat with my eyes now closed. Virtue had gone out of the very roses. We were mysterious only with the mystery of all growing things. Presently I roused myself, and after several attempts climbed out of the roaring tower. Weak as a kitten, I sauntered home by the sea's margin. The crisping foam ran to my feet. I could trace its snow under my tired, lowered limb. The slow, strong sea wind blowing along the evening clouds smooth. My cheeks, I thought of nothing. My mind was calm as the sand stretched before me. I was not unhappy any. I looked at the great sky, the sand, the darkening sea, the flower-fringed cliffs, and thought with tired pleasure how rich I was in having many, many years before me in which to love their beauty. For now they belonged to me. All beauty did. This was the gift of that terrible spirit. I pitied in the tower. My pity, I believed, had released it. In turn, it had swept personal sorrow out of my heart and made me free of all beauty. I felt strangely impersonal. As with our human limitations, we imagine a grain of sand or a clover flower must feel, light-footed, unthinking, calm. I idled homewards, the homing light. And that was fifty years ago. During the rest of the time I stayed there, I asked cautious questions of my aunt, daft Davy, and in the village. But never a shred of a legend could I find that might explain, if explanation were possible, what had happened in the roaring tower. Davy was terrified and refused to answer me, and my aunt stared at me as though I had gone mad. But the gift of the roaring tower has never left me throughout my long life, filled to the brim with sorrow and happiness. Part of me is untouchable. Part of me can always escape into the watching, surrounding beauty of the natural world and be free. It is to be wondered at. Now I am too old a woman to make Concessions to those who believe that this world is the only world we shall ever inhabit, but I am not afraid to die. Unhaunted, voiceless, a mere ruin of stones, the roaring tower may stand to this day. But I have never returned there to see. The Roaring Tower by Stella Gibbon. Thank you for listening. If you did, I hope you found that interesting. Um, I hope um, you... Uh, I'd love to know what you thought. Thought of both the choice, even the reading. I'm up for criticism, not just platitudes. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it this afternoon. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. I read a couple this afternoon, and that was the one that stood out. Good choice, says Barry. Thank you. Thank you. Very mysterious. 
What do you think it was all about? You tell me what you think it was all about. I never read about the stories till I've read them. Then I have a little sit and think. And then um, I have a read about them. But I'd love to know what you th thought it was all about. This turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th, 19-year-old girl remembered as a 70-something, 60-something woman. The end of her life. What did you love about it? <laughs> um. She did feel better. She did feel better. The nineteen. We've all been nineteen. We've all been nineteen <clears throat> and had that love. Mm -hmm. Summer loving. <laughs> is it? Is this a turn of the century version of Greece? Yeah, but. I'd like, I need to know what you think before I tell you what I think. I've got, I've got thoughts. <laughs> Sorry, it's quite. I've got thoughts. So who's read Cold Comfort Farm? I definitely think there was a happy ending involved, personally. I don't think it was in the demons. I don't think it was in the demons. <laughs> I'm being, maybe I'm seeing too much into it. <laughs> yes, she did offer that help, made her realize she was the piece of it, releasing, releasing herself to the. To the the de the inner demons to the actual demon, I mean that call, the the, the description to Milton's archangel, of course, anyone and this the whole Bloomsbury set, Ginny Wolf and all of those you know Lytton Strachey and all those writers and poets they they all mm, fell at the altar of um of uh. Oh gosh, what's his name? Songs, songs of innocence and experience. Oh my goodness me! Anyway, Milton and the such like, the whole kind of um, heart of their stories being of sex and death. You know, these were stories written between World War One and World War Two. So we have the we have the the the, the, the horror of war and and the terror of poverty and the crash, but also the the continuation of of society and its ups and its downs, both literal and metaphorical. Blake, that's who I was reaching for, sorry. Um, oh, you should always talk to your daughter first, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs>